We know not the time when he comes. Real Epic at 97.1, the authentic station. It may be a deep and in twilight. Real Epic at 97.1, the authentic station. He bids us to watch Real and be ready. Real Epic at 97.1, the authentic station. That when he shall come, he may find us awaiting and watching for him. Real FM 97.1, the authentic station. Real FM 97.1, the authentic station. The price of salvation has cost. Real FM 97.1, the authentic station. 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 Very good. You are welcome to our um, uh, Bible study session on the theme, This is a Wonderful Journey. And uh, I would like to share with us um, Yeah, I would like us to go back to our text in the morning, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Are we there? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Uh, the Bible says, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Let us pray. One more time, Lord, we seek that from your throne of mercy, may the Holy Spirit descend upon our hearts to interpret these things that he wrote through your male and female servants. And at the end of this uh, session of interaction, we pray that it is your name that will be lifted up, glorified, and praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Um, let me begin by saying that um, the World's Adventurous Day, and especially this one, is very, very unique because of the theme that we have. It challenges us to begin thinking about our relationship with our children in view of eternity. It is not just about the food we can afford to put on the tables for them or the clothes that we can buy for them or to make them to be what we want, extension of our unfulfilled dreams. To some of us, because we were not able to become doctors, we want our children to become doctors, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not about life because there is something bigger and more than that. And so that is what the theme for this year is all about. It goes beyond that we, when we are thinking about their career, when we are thinking about clothes, we're thinking about food, when we are thinking about these little ones, how which environment, which school we can take them to, and all those kind of things, we are simply answering to this one great question. 
where in terms of eternity will our children be? And so that is the great question that should be ringing in our minds as we go through this afternoon's presentation. I remember telling us, and I am going this afternoon to do largely my presentation is, um, is um, taken from the book Adventist Home. And, and the reason is I am challenging us, every one of us to go to the ABC here, the Central Church, and get this book. I know you can get it still uh, online. Uh, from the LNG White uh, uh, estate, but I will, I will challenge you that get the hard copy, and there is a reason. Um, you know, uh, those people who have gone to school have told us now that books are not going anywhere. They have told us books are here to stay, and that serious people will always go to the books. They will always go to the books. So if, if you have your own book and you read and a statement, you know, kind of uh, pricks you, you can even highlight it. You, ha you can highlight. And every time you go back to it, it encourages your heart, as opposed to just reading it online. Online is also okay. It's the same material. But what I'm challenging you is to go and get a hard copy. It's, it's uh, I think, about seven or 800 shillings, soft copy here at the ABC. And, and those literature evangelists who are, is there any literature evangelist here? Those people working in the literature evangelism ministry, there is not even one, okay, maybe, maybe they were here in the morning. It's just important to get them to be bringing such like things and for our members to, to, to get. So I will, I will spend more time, and as I said, Ellen G. White has dedicated a, a hoping, you know, from chapter 28. Sorry. Yeah, right from chapter 28, running up to chapter 44, is about just family, how we can relate with one another, and more especially with the children. So I, I'm not going just to give, uh, you know, small. I'll, I'll highlight as I move in terms of how we can be able to bring up our children in view of eternity. That is um, basically what I want to struggle with uh, this afternoon so that we can be able to appreciate. Um, let me begin by making this uh, statement that uh, there are many things that angels know. But there are a few things that angels don't know. One of the things that angels do not know is when a family or a man or a woman has a child and they have to bring up that child. Angels do not understand that. They are normally sent from heaven to come and aid the parents in directing and most importantly in protecting our children. By the way, the angels that work with children are more active as compared to the angels that work with us. You know, we are uh, heavy-headed. We are heavy-headed. But the angels that work with these uh, young people, the adventurers, they are extremely, extremely active. Did you know you can get, get to a place where you meet your child playing with a snake and nothing happens? A snake will only bite that child when you come, when you come in. And you come in with your thunder and, and you are shocked. And, and the adrenaline is, gets into the system. And then the snake is able to notice that. Then it knows there is danger here. Or as you are walking, it feels the rumbles on the ground. Then, then the snake knows there is danger coming. Otherwise, a snake cannot bite a child. Are you listening to me? Let me also say that as we struggle to nurture, to sculpture, to, to mold the character of children to help them become what they ought to be angels always wonder they look at it and they don't understand in swahili we say how a party picture they they cannot understand what is this thing then all of a sudden they see this little innocent boy or girl grow up and they see them doing what they are doing they are able to recite 21 fundamental beliefs 
Do you know if I picked at, on some of you at random, those of you who are now adults like myself, if I at random picked on you, even if I picked on 10 of you, 10 of you may not be able to give me 21 fundamental beliefs. You are likely to repeat what others are saying. And, and so this, this tells you, so angels look at them and they wonder, they shudder. They, they look at it and what, what is this wisdom? What is this knowledge that goes into this thing? Producing a, a child, an individual who can worship God reverently, an individual who fears the Lord, an, an individual who loves the Lord, and they get to a place and they say, you know, we don't want to live in sin, we want to live for the Lord. It, it is not an easy thing. And angels don't know this particular business. Am I talking to somebody? So basically, we parents, we have a privilege. We have an assignment that angels were never given. We know something about parenting that angels do not know. Yes, they are mighty today. They are great. They live in heaven. They are next to the throne of God. Yet they do not understand what you and I who are a distant third from the throne of God. What we know, what we understand, what we experience, they don't. Take it heartily as an and no other holier calling than taking care of these little ones. There is no other holier calling than helping these little children become friends of Jesus. Nothing is greater than that. And I think this is what Amram and his wife Jochebed discovered. And for that reason, they gave their all. And after giving their all, they discovered it was worth rewarding. Especially when they saw that this very, very young man, they labored for the few months when they discovered he was one of the great leaders in the whole world. And so, thank you so much. And so, welcome so that we can be able to walk together and um, try to understand these things uh, that the servant of the Lord has given us. As I said, you can start right from chapter 26, but I will spend some little time probably um, from uh, chapter 29, and I think that will be good, yeah? Uh, chapter 29 of Adventist Home. And, and she begins by saying that, parents, you carry responsibilities that no one can bear for you. As long as you live, you are accountable to God to keep his way. Parents who make the word of God their guide and who realize how much their children depend upon them for the characters they form will set an example that it will be safe for their children to follow. This is found on page 187. This is, I've said, is chapter 29. So you can always go to chapters. Work with chapters as, as opposed to pages. Work with chapters and you'll appreciate and you'll enjoy that. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think I was uh, running. Okay, yeah, thank you. The servant of the Lord, you know, I'm from the village, so holding a mic, you know, I'm not, I've not become an urbanite uh, so much. I'm, you know, struggling with the mic. Please uh, have mercy on me. Uh, so, um, so this particular responsibility that we've been given, what we call parental responsibility, Ellen, Ellen G.Y. says that the, the children the character they form depends on us, on what we do. So you can imagine. That's why I've always said, as a parent, for whatever reason, you determine the destiny. And for whatever reason, should I die today? Or should my child die today? Their destiny depends on where I will be. And that, that is, you know, very, very expensive to, to take it lightly because then, I, I determine where my child will spend, you know, the rest of his or her eternity. So, so this is something I take it very seriously. 
And I take it as a solemn assi assignment from the Lord. And, and so she says, fathers and mothers are responsible for the health, the constitution, the development of the character of their children. No one else should be left to see this. No one else should be left to, to see to this work. In becoming the parents of children, it devolves upon you to cooperate with the Lord in educating them in sound principles and she says in this one the church alone cannot assume these responsibilities no pastor can assume this responsibility nor any sabbath school can be able to handle this responsibility this is what the servant of the lord says in other words you cannot transfer it you cannot give it even to your house girl you cannot give it to your cousin or your brother or your sister no it is you who is a parent that is very very critical now in chapter 30 she talks about how our relationship and the need for us to make time and and here she says especially page 190 no page 191 and paragraph 3 she says there are those of us who say i don't have time you've had in fact the the subtitle there is no time so he says, no time. He says, no time, says the father. I have no time to give to the training of my children. No time for social and domestic enjoyment. Then you should not have taken upon yourself the responsibility of a family. By withholding from them the time which is justly theirs, you rob them of the education which they should have had at your hands. If you have children, you have a work to do in union with the mother in the formation of their characters. In other words, as a father, you need to cooperate with your, with your, with your wife and, and ensure that this work is done. Don't say there is no time. Then he says, it is the cry of many mothers. Many mothers also say, I have no time to be with my children. Then for Christ's sake, she says, she advises mothers for whatever reason because you are busy. She says, eh, eh, he says, spend less time on your dress cut down on your amount of of uh, you know choosing dress in the you know the, the time you spend you know before in your wardrobe and you struggle you pick on this one you put it on you remove you go and pick another one and you go before the mirror you check and you remove she says spend less cut time so that you can make time for your children she says neglect if you will do to adorn your apparel in other words, the apparel goes, you know, clothing and everything else, including the hair, your, 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 you know, your lips, your, your fingers, your nails and all those. She says, reduce the amount of time for adornment so that there can be some little time that goes in for the children. Hello? Mothers, are you here? Very good. So she says, neglect to cook an endless variety of dishes so that you create time. But never, never neglect your children. Because if you neglect them today, tomorrow when you will need them, they will not be there. They will actually neglect you because you neglected them. Are we together, my friends? And so this is very, very critical. She, she says, um, be with your children. Join them. Give some of your leisure hours to your children. Associate with them in their work and in their sports and win their confidence. Cultivate their friendship. Says, let parents devote their evenings to their families. Lay off care, publicity with the labors of the day. Don't uh, uh, carry, sometimes we carry our assignments to our house. What you do is, you can do that assignment. Uh, it is understood but do the assignment when the children have gone to sleep play with them do everything with them when they are done and you know they have gone to sleep go and now burn your midnight oil with your assignments if you want if you must do them but do not be busy when they need you because when they need you and you appear to be busy you are telling them that they don't matter what matters is your job is the assignment that you are doing you don't want to tell your child that but by action that's what you'll be tell telling them and that is a very dangerous trend that when children grow up they will discover that because they were neglected and this is how you will see some of these children psychologists say when you see children who are always with their fingers in the mouth have you seen children who are always biting their fingers they are in class four they're always with their fingers in their mouth they're in class five they're still with their fingers have you seen those kind of children 
Yeah. One of the reasons, this is not the only reason, one of the reasons is these kids are lamenting by way of, they are finding pleasure in their, in their finger because the parents did not give them adequate time. This, this one you can read, you can go and read. Psychology of children is not something that uh, is only known to one person. You can go to Google and see how children behave when they have been neglected. Or signs of neglect that has been, you know, exposed to, they, they have been exposed to. So, so she says, make sure that you associate with them. And, and when you associate with them, the evil associates and company and competitors at home will not find chance to be with your children. The only way to protect your children from others is, is you being closer. If you are not, they will always find association in evil company. So, so the only way to protect them from that, she says, is to ensure that you create room and be there, play with them. This is very, very critical. Now, in uh, chapter 31, she talks about security through love. How, how you, we can be able to make our children more secure. Both in terms of uh, you know, having a positive self-image about themselves. Looking at themselves with a positive value, sense of value. She, she says the way we can do is to show them love. In other words, she says, you know, love is, is a plant to be nourished. She says, home is to be the center of the purest and more elevated affection. Peace, harmony, affection. In other words, one of the best things you can give to your children is, is to... If, if you want your children to, to see love for them, men who are here, listen, listen to me. Show love to their mother. Tell their mother in their hearing, I love you. Tell their mother in the hearing of the children. Tell them, hey, sweetie, I love you. They will even laugh if they have not heard about it for a long time. They say, hey, daddy. <laughs> then they will go and ask the mother, mom, Daddy was calling you, sweetie. What is sweetie? Uh, you know, um, it, it grows. It makes them to grow knowing that we are catered for because our mother is loved. When you love their mother by extension, young children by extension are the beneficiaries of that love that you demonstrate to their mother. Has somebody heard what I've said? Oh, very very good so so he, she says because love is a plan to be nourished it must be done in a home and this must be seen it must be visible in the principles taught to the children they must be able to see this coming in and 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 then of course she says when, when children um when, when children are growing what they need most is love more than food so, so she says spend more time giving them love and the only way to show love is to be there for them play with them get interested when visitors come home and a child comes to talk to you as a father and visitors are seated at home big men you know some of you are very senior guys so you know some of your colleagues are visited and you are seated there and your child your son or your daughter comes this is an adventurer and taps at your shoulder and she wants or he wants to talk to you don't tell them go and talk to your mother no uh, what you do hello excuse yourself from the visitors they know this is a child and the child needs attention of the father or mother anytime anywhere priority is always theirs it is not the visitors so when they tap at you get excuse yourself and get out with the, the child or the boy or the girl and talk to them as I said at their height not at your height don't, don't lean on them and say, what are you saying? Uh -uh. No, you don't do that. You go at their level. And, and this is what makes even children appreciate guests. If children come, uh, if guests come and children come to you and you tell them, no, no, go talk to your mother. Children will hate visitors when they come home. Are you listening to me? Oh, very good, very good. So basically, this is um, part of the counsels that she gives. As I've said, I'm only highlighting because I do not have much time. Then she says, you know, preoccupy. She says, parents are gardeners. Parents are gardeners. The garden is the child. The heart of the child is the garden. As a gardener, spend more time doing gardening. And the way to do gardening is you have to cultivate. You have to put manure there. The much that you put in is the much you will get. We say um, 
the language of computer, we say uh, garbage in, garbage out. So, so basically, you, as parents, we need to spend more time, put in more. If you want to get more out of this child, put in more. If you want to get less out of that child, also put in less. Are we together? Very, very important. Then, of course, um, um, in chapter 33, she talks about divine promises and guidance. I wish I, I, wish I had time to talk about it. Um, then uh, we go to sec- chapter 34, which is section 9, the father. And, and she, she simply says, the father, the word husband, she says, your name. That's a saying. It says, his name, husband, is supposed to be house band. That's what Ellen Jewai says. This Adventist homepage 211, paragraph 3, says his name, house band, is true definition of husband. A, a house band, this band that is used for bringing, you know, our, our ladies, when they do their hair, they, want, they put a rubber band behind. That is the band. So as a husband, ours is to house band. is to be a rubber band that ties the family together. Now, that's the definition of a husband, according to her. That means that the husband is the head of the household. The wife looks to him for love and sympathy and for the aid and training of the children. This is the right. The children are his as well as hers, and he's equally interested in their welfare. The children look to the father for support and guidance. He needs to have a right conception of life and of the influence of associations that should surround his family. So as a father... Take time and get interested. Show that you have an interest. I said in the morning, as a man, you are the priest. And she says, all members of the family center in the father. He is the lawmaker illustrating in his own manly bearing the standard virtues, energy, integrity, honesty, patience, courage, diligence, and practical usefulness. As a man, these are the qualities in terms of what our children need as they grow up. The wife and children should be encouraged to unite in this, in this offering and also engage in the song of praise. Morning and evening, the father, as a priest of the household, should confess to God the sins committed by himself and his children through the day. Those sins which have come to his knowledge and also those which are a secret of which God's eye alone has taken cognizance should be confessed. Ellen G. White is telling us that that is what we are supposed to do. The sins they have committed that we know. And even those that we don't know. We know they are youths. They are young people. They will do stupid things out there. Our business is to plead with heaven for forgiveness. Amen? Are we together? Am I speaking, talking to myself? Okay, so, so then she encourages us, as a father be this particular person, I'm going, coming to the mothers in a little while. So the fathers, please, the best way we can do for our children, let's be the priest, let's carry them in our hearts. I'm told there are some elders in the church who when they are called upon to pray from up here, they will offer a very nice prayer. When they go home, they will rarely call for prayers. And yet they come to church. You wonder, why... why? Why do we have to become that hypocritical? That I can only pray when I'm here on the pulpit, but in my house I cannot tell my wife, hey, babe, uh, it's now time for us to pray. Please, children, come around. We want to sing. Then lead out in song, lead out in prayer, or ask one of the child to lead out in prayer, or one of the child to lead out in, in singing or in reading. I mean, if I cannot do that at home, I should not do that kind of hypocritical things on the pulpit. It, it is worse off. I would rather you don't even pray from here. Am I saying something? Very, very critical. So, Elder or Asha, when you go back home and you cannot call your children for prayer, you have no business calling people to prayer in the church. That is very, very critical. So, be there. Walk with God, as we said in the morning. You must be, as fathers, we must be mature. In fact, she says, a father must not be a child. Moved merely by impulse, is bound to his family by sacred holy ties. The only way then she suggests is that we should submit to the will of God and have uh, understand that we are weak, yes, but make sure that we submit to the will of God for him to lead us in the way we lead our children. And, and she says exercise authority with humility. 
please don't keep reminding your children, don't you know that I'm the father here? Just like you don't have to tell your wife, don't you know that I'm the head of the family? It simply means you are bereft of abilities to think and argue out. You don't have to go that direction. If you have nothing to say, you can just keep quiet. Because your wife knows that you are the husband. You don't have to remind her. And your children know that you are the father. You don't have to, don't you know that I'm the father? No, they know that better. So you don't have to, you know, to make yourself a little bit more useless before them. If you have nothing, you can just keep quiet. Okay? And that is very, very important. Uh, then in chapter five, 35, she says, We are supposed to know that the father's duty in bringing up children cannot be transferred. And listen to this. Very, very important. The father's duty to his children cannot be transferred to the mother. So you cannot say, You... Take care of the children because I'm looking for money for you. No, don't do that. Your wife is the mother to the children. The children are looking forward to the father. You cannot transfer it. And, 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 and as, a mother, you, as a mother, you cannot be a father and a mother. A mother can just be a mother. Just in the same way, a father can only be a father. You cannot be a father and a mother at the same time. It is not transferable. The father should not excuse himself from his part in the work of educating his children for life and immortality. He, he must share in the responsibility that is obligation for both father and mother. There must be love and respect manifested by the parents for one another if they would see these qualities. In other words, as a father, make sure that the way you want children to walk is the same way the, fa the mother wants them to walk so that you do not conflict any conflict shown in the way you want to do things before these children you have confused them forever and they will never know which way it is it just takes the grace of god for them perhaps to find a way out never argue before your children for for the sake of your children postpone your argument when they have gone to sleep begin your argument have I said something? If you must argue, you wait. Uh, just agree on everything now that they are there. And when the children go to sleep now, go to your bedroom and begin arguing. Pursue your arguing if you end up to morning, no problem. But don't argue in their presence. No, no, no. Uh, 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 please, uh, uh, Rhoda, can, can, you, can you do something there? And the mother says, no, uh, Rhoda, I've given her some work. That is a very dangerous trend in parenting. Let Rhoda go to do what the father said. But you can explain to the father when she's going to say, i had given her some other work to do. Uh, what do we do? So now you can agree. Oh, then you can call her. Oh, Rhoda, please come. Your mother had given you something. And she said, say yes. Okay, can you finish what your mother had said? Then you go to what? That is how to do it. But don't tell your husband, no. Uh, why are you disturbing my child? No, you don't do that. If you do that, you are burying that child alive. You are excluding that child from the commonwealth of faith. And so, make sure that you work together. Agree. Agree on what you must agree. And if you must disagree, then make sure you do that away from their presence. Children don't need your stuff. If you have issues, you are adult. After all, we have already failed. We can continue doing our failed stuff when, uh, when they are out of the picture. When they are there, let us be civil. Let us, let us be civil. Let's, let's try to work together. Am I saying something? Now, um, so, so sharing burdens, she talks about in chapter 35, uh, show consideration for your wife, I uh, lead softly and tenderly, yeah, uh, um, yeah, don't just be a, uh, always over, you know, doing it, companion with these children, and I think this is important, as, as a father, spend time with your children, yeah, yeah. The, the average father wastes many golden opportunities to attract, bind his children to him. Upon returning home from his business, he should find it a pleasant change to spend uh, some time with his children. Get time, get time. Um, get, get time and get a rope with your wife and let all the children line up in the middle there. Your wife is the other side of the rope, you are this side of the rope. Bubble gum, bubble gum. Uh, uh, eh? Can you help me sing with it? <laughs> bubble gum. 
I went for a walk. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. When, when children are in the middle there, you don't know what that means. They are not on, they don't, they not only feel protected, but what happens is the atmosphere is so enabling that they cannot allow any root of bitterness to grow in them. Play with them. And, and when they fail, they come and they hold the rope and the father goes in between and you fail. They laugh at you. That laughter is not for nothing. That laughter finally is what makes them to trust. Being a villager is almost equivalent to, to being a, a sick. I'm sorry. So, so, so basically, you know, where they, they trust you. They win their, your confidence. They, they want to come and confide in you. Even down those, some of those neat details that they will, under normal circumstances, not tell you, they will come when they play with you. So as a father, when you come from work, get off your coat, get off your ties, get off, put on a, a, some shorts, and begin playing with them, seek and hide. If they are all play with them some tennis and or go for a walk. If they are, you know, these grown up kids, you know, put on your trucks and go out for a walk. Walk with them for some kilometers and come back because in the city here you may not have uh, so many opportunities like it is in the village. Uh, go for a walk. Walk along this street and go on Fourth Avenue. You know, walk it to the end and go to the other side. Go to the junction and come back with them. And they feel they have a father or a mother who is real. Are we together, my friends? So, so be there. Train children for usefulness. I, I on this one, we have really failed. Children are at home. But it's the house, house help who does everything. No. That is not right training. She says, let's train our children for usefulness. If it is working on gardens out there for flowers, let the children do it. Are, you, are we together? When it comes to mopping the house, let the children participate in mopping. When it comes to, to doing some house chores, let the children get involved. It is it's washing utensils, washing what? Teach them when will they learn. It is true there is this house help who helps. But now your children are there. How, where will you get chance to train them for usefulness? Teach them and go out, take a jembe and work with them. There are some of us mothers whose, uh, whose children, daughters are at the university and they don't know how to slice chicken. They don't know how just to slice chicken. They cannot, they cannot slaughter and slice it into pieces and cook. They don't know. And if they did, they will do it with very terrible things in between there. And so this is what we say. Can we train our children for usefulness? Allow them. And that is what the whole thing about Adventurous Club. You know, adventure. We teach them to learn practical skills. They, they learn on how a home looks like, on how to keep themselves neat, how to... These are the skills we are supposed to impart in them. Because we don't know who these children will live with tomorrow. At least I know today, because I'm there. But I don't know who will live with them. I don't want my children... To be chased out of somebody's home who will only have brought them in to help them. I don't want them to be to be chased. Yeah. I, I, I want somebody to appreciate and say, Wow, this guy, uh, though he is not alive, but he must he must have done a good job. Look at the way. In fact, in fact, the, the, the new home where my children are, are being kept, the, 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 the parents should say, they should tell their children, why can't you be, which is not good, of course, it's not acceptable, but they should say, look, why can't you be like, why can't you be responsible? You get a, a, a home where a, a boy in form two, form three, they don't know how to spread bed. They wake up and go. It's the household who, I'm telling you, I, I told my wife, as long as God has given me life, I'm still alive. By God's grace, I will help my children to learn to do that. Not house helps. No. House helps have their own role. They'll do. But I'll make sure that my kids, when he wakes up, he knows that he must spread the bed. If he does not, we will talk. We will talk and say, man, 
can you just explain to me what is this thing that is so hard for you to spread your bed? Because the truth, and this is psychology again, they say people who spread their beds in the morning are also ready to do well-organized chores in the course of the day as compared to those who wake out and jump out of bed and they go. Even men who wake up, because some men stay now alone in the city like I do sometimes, what happens is when you jump out of bed, you don't spread your bed, you can be sure that day will not be okay with you. Because you have forgotten the most basic things that you ought to have put in order. And this is very, very critical. Uh, again, I think a few things uh, just to mention as I move towards uh, the winding space. Associate with them. Uh, be with them at work in, and, and in sports, we say that. Teach them lessons from nature. Take them out there. Go with them to the arboretum and, and uh, teach them about the buds, you know, the buds that are there. This bud comes from Australia. This one comes from India because there are buds that come to the arboretum whose origin is not here. There are those that come all the way from Australia for mating at the arboretum. When they have mated, they, they give birth and when they have hatched, they, they go back with their children back to Australia. You know, you need to tell them this yellow picked uh, bird comes from this country. So you need to learn, you need to, you know, update your, your, your mind. And teach them about the species of trees and tell them what are some of these trees used for. You do not know what will happen to your child and how these trees and lessons of those trees and birds will help them tomorrow. So very, very critical. Um, then she talks about the kind of husband not to be. I will not go to that because this is a very bad day for men. I wish you can, we can read. Take time and read this. this. This one, when I get here, I normally sit down as I read slowly. Because it speaks to my heart. It challenges me. It rebukes me. The kind of man that I'm not supposed to be. And then it goes now to mothers. The queen of the household. While the man is the king, the wife is the queen. Wow. And she says, the wife is the husband's equal. We are equal. Sometimes I've wondered when I see Christians saying that we are equal. We are. What else are you asking for? We are. Unless if you are asking for something more. We are equal. That is it. All of us created in the image of God. And then she says, as the queen at home, what you do, hey, hey, what you do at home, your work is more sacred than the work of your husband who is working at the treasury minting millions for, for you at home. What have I said? The work of a mother, she says, is more sacred Oh my, this is a very, very interesting. What she does, especially you men, I mean, have you ever seen when your wives go home, when they travel and they go to their villages or wherever, or they are visiting some people, how the home look like? You know, how, how our homes look like? Especially if you have some uh, chicken in the house. <laughs> you know, in, even your bed will be a place for the sleeping, sleeping for the chicken. I mean, it will be all over. The, the house is shaky, shabby. You don't even want to come back home you want, uh, early. You want to come late just to come and sleep and again leave when it is too dark. So that you don't see the mess in the house. Now, now that is very true. Sometimes we overestimate what we do. We think what we are doing out because we are making money. We think what they are doing is less. No. She says the work that the mother does at home is more sacred. Just, you know, if you quantify it, it doesn't make sense. She's just walked from point A to point B. Going to the kitchen, if she's at home. You know, she goes to the kitchen, she comes to the sitting room, she goes to the, to the toilet, uh, uh, take care of this. And at this trip, if you were to spread it, it, you, in one day, it could be between from here and Nakuru, walking on foot. That's a lot of work. When you come in, the house is clean. Kids have eaten. Your cows have been watered. And they have been grazed. And you wonder how? No wonder, no wonder God gave us women. Sometimes I imagine how life would have been without a wife. I look at it and I say, God, thank you for having seen it ahead. 
Sometimes, only when we have them, we don't appreciate them. You know, you only appreciate something when you have lost it. That's when you understand it's worth. Ile, ile bibi yako unasumbua sumbua, we musumbue tu. Because according to you, she's uh, not very important. We musumbue, siku moja atatoka kwa hiyo bomb. Then you will understand. Yeah. No, have I said something? Hello? Have I said something? It says, the work is greater and no work is holier. Angels would have loved to get that job. They cannot be assigned. Says a mother, a co-worker with the minister. So she says, a mother is a missionary in the home. And the father is a missionary out. So I'm here preaching. I'm here preaching. My son and my wife are at home. Because my, my daughter, two daughters are now out and my son. So I have a son at home. This, this, this young man is there with my wife. My wife has to ensure that, you know, he has to speak some sense to his mind. He, she has to, to help him to see, to know. I mean, matches what I'm doing here, I'm preaching to the masses. What she's doing at home is more sacred than what I'm doing from the pulpit here. That's what Ellen G. White says here. And then, of course, um, so sculpturing the likeness of the divine. Faithful mother enrolled. In fact, she says, when you remember the story of Moses here, she says the story of Moses is only mentioned because of Jochebed. There would not have been a Moses without Jochebed. That woman. Wamama tunawavulia kofia. I wish you men from here, wala ambao muna wa mama, na ataka maola ambao mama hawana waze, I wish you wanaume mungepanga siku moja, mununue maua, mununue sweets na nini, vizuri vizuri ya kupatia wa mama wote, just to celebrate them. I wish, I wish the uh, Adventist uh, men organization could organize for that. You see, you know, the, she, she, uh, Ellen Joy says, Moses' story would not have been there if it was not for the godly mother, Jochebed. That's why when you read casually Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 23, you think it is about Moses. No, Moses is the object. The subject is the parents, the mother and the father. And so, <clears throat> then she talks about uh, influence of a mother. Wow, this one is just too much. Says, like mother, like child. Now, mothers, listen. The tenderest earthly tie is that between the mother and her child. The child is more readily embraced by the life and example of the mother than by that of the father. For a stronger and more tender bond of a union unites them. You know the reason? The mother shares the same body. They, they live in the same body. For nine months, the mother and the child, they live in the same body. They breathe the same oxygen. They share the same blood. The tendencies, whether evil or good, in the mother, whatever disposition in the mother will be shared by the child. They share at least for nine months. And when the child is born, the first person again to begin training this child is the mother. How else, you men, how will you get a chance to really get this child on your side? And sometimes then we complain, oh, you know, this woman has taken all children from me. It, it is natural. It is so natural. You did not play your role. That's why I told you in the morning, come beat your wife. Come beat your wife. At night, when your wife is breastfeeding, after breastfeeding, take that child and begin playing with them. Yeah, let the wife finish breastfeeding. After finishing, say, bring that child to me. Then begin playing with that child. So the mother has done the breastfeeding, but yeah, so that the child grows seeing both father and mother. In his eyes, in his mind, is this a father who loves and a mother who cares. You know, that should never live. I was telling some parents, you know, was complaining. You know, my, my wife has taken all the children away from me. I said, oh, what, what did you do? I said, I've, I've been paying school fees. You, you don't know. You give the money to your wife to go and pay. And she pays. And she will pay, surely. But when she goes to that school to see your child, because you, you are very busy, you don't want to go there. She goes and she sits with the child. If it's a girl and a mother... 
So the mother cries. The mother cries. She tells the daughter, you know my daughter, Apa Kwenyu, for me there is no life here. It is you. My all hope is in you. You see, I have even walked. I had half transport fare to come to this place. I walked half the distance. And she shows how, she shows how dirty her feet are. And, and, and she tells the girl, please my daughter. And she begins crying. Then as she cries, you see, they cry for everything. <laughs> so you never know uh, crying for pain or for pleasure. Pleasure, they cry. Pain, they cry. Disappointed, they cry. When they're happy, they cry. So she cries. And when she cries, the daughter cries. And they hold each other. They wipe each other's. So the daughter wipes the mother's tears and says, Mom, relax. I will work hard. And I'll take care of you. My friend, there is no witchcraft that is heavier than that. You have lost that child forever. The best way you can do to undo the bewitching is you also go to school. Yeah. Go to school and tell her, my daughter, up in, on this world, there is no life without you. You are my only hope. Things are not working for me. Everywhere, everything is not just working. I'm, I'm putting my all hope in you, please. You may not cry, of course. It. And, and once she gets it, I'm telling you, she will promise you that she's going, do that, commit. When you do that, your wife will never take your children from you. Otherwise, you will see what we are seeing today. You come home, and if you ask your son to give you some money, your wife tells uh, your son, if you give your father money, he will get married to another woman. Don't give him, let him tell you what he wants, send money to me, I can do it for him. So if, if you wanted to buy a shirt, your son cannot give you 500 to buy a shirt. He will send 500 to your wife and your wife will go to Kigomba to get a 200 worth shirt. She gives the next 300. And this is what is happening out there. You cannot get any money from your child. And if you do, your child gives you money when the wife is watching. She gives you money when your wife is watching. When she gives or he gives the mother, it will be in your absence. She gives when the mother is watching so that when she leaves, the mother comes and says, uh, you know, we don't have food here. What she was given, you have no idea. She's asking to share in what you are given. That is what is happening. Because you did not do your utmost. Men, I'm telling you, spend time with your children. The only reason that will make your retirement moments to be a blissful moment is if your children are with you. You have house banded them. You have, you have bound them to your own heart. You will enjoy life in your old age. Have I said something, men? So mothers, we have a responsibility, a solemn duty. Let's, let's do our work, yes, mothers. But let's make sure that we do not do that so that we can expel men from out. Because if you expel a man from out, your children will be successful, but their success will not go far. Because the man will curse your children. And so, mothers, your influence is great. Shape their minds. And be there. But there are a few things that I want us to say. Uh, chapter 40. I'm at chapter 41 now. <clears throat> Imperfect patterns of motherhood. As you take care of these children. <clears throat> make sure that um, you have a way. Uh, make sure you have a way uh, of, of um, you know, making sure that your kids are. And uh, I keep on uh, pressing it unknowingly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, mothers, do not live like a martyr. Um, nourish. Make sure that you eat a balanced diet so that you are nourished. But do not nourish a sinful discontent. And especially this happens when 
men leave us with the burdens at home, the burdens of chicken, the burdens of cows and, and the goats and the burdens of, and you also have some work to do in your office. You are a teacher, you are whatever. Then, you know, you have everything. By the time the mother goes to bed, she's so tired. If when children come to her, she doesn't want to listen to them. Get out of this place. You hear those kind of shouting. It's, it is because we have not done a service by helping them so that they can be able to uh, be assisted. But this is not what a mother is supposed to do. Make sure that you weather the storm. Weather the storm and the way to weather the storm. I think in chapter 42 she will explain that uh, your health as a woman is very critical. Do not leave it. Do not leave yourself to be so shapeless, to look like a, a potato, a sweet potato, when you could look like a carrot, if you can. So make sure you can take a walk. Washing utensils and cooking is not, is not a work, doing workout. So just create some time where you can go out there, do some workouts and, and try. Go to the gym if you can afford. If you cannot go, take a walk and get a rope skipping and all. do some aerobics just to ensure that you keep yourself fit. Mothers, in, in a home, mothers are the only ones who can be advocates of health reform. Do you know a mother can train children not to eat foods that are not healthy? It's very easy. Not so with a father. I'm a pastor and I know how hard it is. You can preach and shout until a gum comes out of your mouth and nobody gets it. But if your wife takes it to heart, because if your wife gives you a child uji without sugar, and the child grows up knowing that it's uji, anytime they test uji with sugar, they will refuse. They'll say, no, this is not testing good. Because they will see something strange has been introduced in it. It's, if, if we want to have health reform, it is only through the mothers. And I wish mothers, uh, maybe women ministries, please plan for a seminar. Call for somebody just to come and talk to mothers on how we can embrace health reform in our homes. Because men cannot. If you don't eat a uh, fish, she will make sure that the vegetables she cooks are not palatable. They are not sweet. They are not good until you go back to the fish you had, you had uh, said you are not going to be eating. That, that's what they do intentionally. So, so the best thing is make sure that you you, you, you advocate as mothers because when you do, our children will take it up. And you can be sure that the health of our children will also determine, their physical health will determine even their spiritual health. Very, very good. Exercise of control in diet, as I said, mothers, sometimes you know we eat a lot. Now I, with my age, I have come to understand why sometimes mothers will cook and after cooking they don't eat. They wait until when everybody else has eaten. That's when they, uh, in Africa, that's what I've come to understand. It's because they eat a lot. They test the child is uji. They test this. They, when they are cooking, they are testing. Before it comes to, they have tested quite a lot. So the appetite has already gone. But I think it is possible for us also to know it is not good just to be eating continuously like a goat. I think it is good for us to create some time where we when we can eat and uh, and balance it so that at least we 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 have self-control in terms of diet because diet has a way of connecting us with passions it has a way of determining how we respond with the external stimuli and this is very very critical for us then she says as a mother when your children are at home and you are sick do not demonstrate and show to everybody that you are sick. Oh, by the way, mothers who are here, when a man is sick and a woman is sick at home, is there any difference? Who is more problematic when they are sick? The men. You are right. Men are too demanding when they are sick. In fact, you think they are going to die the next minute, right? But look here. This is what Ellen G. White says. He says, women, mothers, because of your children, radiate sunshine under all circumstances. He says, the mother can and should do much toward controlling her nerves and mind when depressed. Even when she is sick, she can, if she only schools herself, be pleasant and cheerful and can bear more noise than she would, she would 
once have thought possible. She should not make the children feel her infirmities and cloud their young sensitive minds by the depression of the spirits causing them to feel that the house is a tomb, is a grave and the mother's room, the most dismal place in the world. So even when you are sick as a mother, radiate, you know, put on a smile. Yeah, because when a mother goes flat the way men do, even cows in the home will feel it. Even your cat will feel it. Is that true? <laughs> then, of course, finally, as a mother, now listen to me. This is very critical. This has to do with these kids. Esteem, regard the esteem of husband and children. Sisters, that is about our dress. About our dress. Now, I'm not into the height of your skirt or, or dress. That's not what I'm into. I Me, mean, I'm just saying, you need to know that the dress we put on, it causes depression to our children or not. And this is what Ellen G. White says. Say, sisters, when about their work, should not put on clothing which would make them look like images to frighten the cross from the corn. It is more gratifying to their husbands and children to see them in a becoming well-fitting attire than it can be to mere visitors or strangers. And to be very sincere, men who are here, any, ta any given time you are at home, our wives, I don't know who trained them that when they are at home, especially when we are there, that's the time you'll never see her hairstyle because it will have a socks on top of the head. That's the, the, I don't know who told them that when they put on good clothing the way they are putting on now, it's like they don't feel comfortable. So they put on, like Ellen G.Y. says, they put on and when they have dressed, they look like scarecrows. You know, those, uh, those uh, images to scare the crows from the corn. And, and you don't know, this thing makes your children to suffer from low self-esteem. And if you want to know that, listen now, this is an assignment. Car away. When you go home tonight, if you have your child, take them to your wardrobe. Mothers, are you here? Take your child to your wardrobe. This is a adventurous and ask them if i came to school to visit with you which of these dresses would you like me to put on okay don't ask them which one not to put on ask them which one they would be very happy if you put on and they will show you this one you ask any other one they say this one and what about another one they say this one when they stop there please stop there what they are telling you is, anytime I see you in this kind of thing, I am sick. Go do that. And especially when they are, they've graduated from adventurous, they go to pathfinders, teenaging, they are even more sensitive on how you dress. As long as you have your children, the issue of my dress, my choice disappears. Because you are affecting their esteem. Have I said something? Up to that level, because of time, I beg to request if there is any question I respond to, and then we pray, and then we go. Any question? Have you loved the book Ellen G. White, Adventist Home? Very good. Any question? Or addition? Any question or addition? So that we, we can wrap it up and uh, allow the, the team to continue with uh, what they were doing. Brother Warry, you want to say something? Oh, it's gone. Okay, good. Yes, my fellow uh, uh, my brothers and sisters. <coughs> Any question maybe? You want to Yes, yes. Oh, where is it? Okay, yes. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Let's hear a few. Let's take a few. Maybe we'll take just three. We respond to them and then we fold up. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor. I think this is an eye opener for all of us. Thank you, sir. One thing that I normally observe, especially we are in the era of smartphones. That's true. That's true. Especially at home. Yes, yes. You find like it's so easy. The child cries for the smartphone and you compromise. Yes. Because maybe you don't want to be disturbed. You bribe. You bribe bribe. your child. Yes. Yes. So (laughs) how are we supposed to deal with this issue? Because, you know, within it, there are some other programs, for example, Instagram. You find like parents cannot catch up, you know, with those programs. Mm -hmm. And yet, these are the children that we want to protect. Yes. And another point also, when it comes to eating, you know, you want to bleed with a child on what to eat. You know, they can say, I don't want to eat this one because they have seen maybe somebody else is eating something and then you kind of bend towards what they want. I know a case where a child was like, please, if you can swallow this one, I can give you something like a soda, you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I was imagining how many sodas are you going to give so long as this person wants to swallow. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, that's okay. Um, any other question? Is there another? Yes, yes. Oh, no. Just behind there, Elder. Yes. Then we come here. Yes, yes. Happy Sabbath. Happy day, sir. Mine is an addition. It is not a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I have ever been uh, a Sunday school teacher. Yes. So sometimes parents leave these roles to the Sunday school teachers. Uh Uh-huh. If you read chapter 29. Yes. Verse 7, it can say. Uh-huh. Nor can the Sabbath school. Chapter 29. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very important. Yes, yes. Uh, It is their parents' privilege to help their children obtain that knowledge. Yes. Which they may carry with them into the future. Yes, yes. But for some reason, many parents dislike to give their children religious instructions. Yes. They leave them to pick up in the Sabbath school the knowledge they should impart concerning their responsibility Uh to God. Uh Uh So it is... uh, a responsibility as parents of as the well. parents as much as you want to bring your children so that they can get uh, um, this education from the sunday of the sabbath school teachers, Ye- yes yes you have to have a responsibility so that we don't end up because sometimes you feel like uh, when you are teaching up these children yes there are some you will feel like no i need to maybe have a discussion with the parent just because yes you yes. have not played your role at them okay day. okay thank you my brother yeah so don't leave it with the sabbath school good uh-huh. Um, uh, let, let's take this one and then that should be... Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I wish there was any lady asking on behalf of ladies. <laughs> yes. Okay, mine is a simple question. You can have uh, maybe the husband and the wife. One is too permissive. Yes. And another one is too strict. Yes. And in fact, strict to where you see the, there's no reason to be too strict. Yes. Now you've taught us we need to fight for space. Yes. Do you think it will bring an issue where now I need to be too permissive just to be inclined to this child. So that's fair for my space between the husband and the wife. Okay, thank you. So let me start with uh, obs- the observation that uh, my brother has made here. Um, okay, May, let me begin with yours. Um, this is a little bit uh, easier to crack. Um, uh, of course, the child needs uh, the two. He needs the sternness of the father and the loving care of the mother the two must be combined. The only thing we said, don't argue before the children. Allow the father, if for whatever reason I have overdone it, I'm so, I'm I'm unnecessarily harsh. As a mother, you just wait and later you can tell me, Baba, much as uh, that is what you thought it would, but I thought maybe it was a little more you did you know overdid it and and i don't think that was the right thing okay um and when you see your wife is um you know kind of less is fair you you don't you don't engage her before your children Th- those are things you can do you know in the boardroom we say behind the curtain you you can be able to help each other behind the curtain and say now how can we balance how we can be able to bring up the children so that the sternness of the father is there and the loving care of the mother is there for us to find a balance it's we are not saying that you should stop being stern and we're not saying that the mother should not show you know that uh, that filio that 
that closeness with, with her son or daughter. No. But, but what we are only saying is, as long as you do not disagree before the child, but if there is anything you think has not been done well, do it behind the curtains and correct it together when you are with your child. You correct it together. Uh, tell him, yeah, our son, we are not very happy. So if, if as a woman you come home and you find your husband is uh, beating your child, don't hold your stomach. You know, sometimes you hold your stomach, you, you feel the back it's like it has broken. <laughs> it's like the umbilical cord is getting cut one more time. And you feel, you know, you, because you, you saw him uh, caning very seriously. Uh, you, you don't have, if you don't want to do anything, don't say anything. Just uh, stand there and uh, when he finishes, uh, you want the child. Say, you know, this, this is not the kind of behavior that we want. But you can talk to your husband and say, Baba, I... You are beating that child like a cow. I don't think that is the way we are supposed to do it. You discuss the two of you behind the curtains. Okay. Um, now, and I think I appreciate the addition that you have made, my brother. We really appreciate no person, no pastor can handle your children. These leaders who are dealing with the children cannot handle those children. The, 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 what is needed is the father or the mother. Be there. Accompany them even in the Sabbath school. Sit there with them and, and hear, see what is being taught. And when you go home, you kind of reinforce it. That is what is supposed to be done. Is that okay? Uh, your question was... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The issue of technology. Yeah. Technology is very good. There, there were a few years in 1980s, we were, you know, saying technology is evil. Don't go there. By the time we came to the millennium back, 2000, we were saying, oh, technology is bad. We were, you know, demonizing it. But we've discovered now technology is aiding us to do even the work of God a little, much easier and faster. This is what I would say. Children are supposed, and I think this is even from the people who, who own technology. They say there is what you call parental guidance. You have seen even on the television, they say this particular program needs PG parental guidance have you ever heard of that yeah even those who have come up with technology so we normally say there are gadgets that you can allow children to use but those gadgets that are a little bit with some control especially when they are young as they grow then they can go into the free space but you will have taught them to learn how to control what to see what not to see what to hear and what not to hear that is the first principle but the second principle do not bribe your child using a smart phone. When a child is in the church and they are disturbing, you talk to them, tell them, uh, thank you for your needs, but here we are in church. Would you be kindly be patient a little bit when we finish? You, I will give you that phone, but here, at even you, I need you to hear these things. That's what we are supposed to do. You don't lock your child in the vehicle, then you give them a computer to be watching games. You are spoiling that child. One, there is no... ...to interpret it by themselves. And it is possible for them to get wrong messaging from a, probably a movie or something they were watching that was right. So basically, this is what we are saying. Children are allowed to use technology and nothing wrong but under parental guidance thank you so much it was a pleasure meeting with you and getting a chance to talk to us about how we can bring up these little ones it is a gift from the lord and when we do so the journey is wonderful because we don't stop here we start from here and we end on the sea of glass where we shall be with our children can you just imagine when you got, if you had a chance of getting to the sea of glass, and when you are there, your children are not there. You are only there with your wife. How would it be? Will it feel good? Or you get there, and your wife is not there, or your husband is not there. For whatever reason, all of us should work towards ensuring that all of us, by God's grace, find ourselves by the sea of glass. May the Lord bless us all. Let's pray together. Let's be standing as we do their prayer <clears throat> heavenly father thank you for the privilege and honor that you have given me a sinful being to stand before my sinful brothers and sisters 
to share the counsels from your word on how we can bring up these little ones during this adventurous day that these young people can secure our future and joy tomorrow and that these young people can also secure the presence of your church tomorrow its vibrancy and 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 everything associated with its success depends on what we are doing today to and for these children our desire therefore as a church may we invest in the children's department and as families oh god help us to invest in the children not for the children help us to do the best that we can whatever that we could do a little more help us to do it and patiently waiting for your soon return when we shall be ushered on the other side of life with a commendation well done faithful servant we long for that day or we desire we who have already had children who are overgrown and today we are now seeing the bitter fruits of how indolent and careless we have been we ask for forgiveness and pray that should we get a chance of helping somebody else's child or our grandchildren help us to do the best that we can we thank you and we praise you even as we worship you in we know not the time when he comes real fm 97.1 the authentic station it may be a deep and in real fm 97.1 the authentic station he bids us to watch Real and FM, be ready. Seven point one. The authentic no That when he shall come, he may find us awaiting oh, and watching for him. Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station 97.1 The price our salvation has cost Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station Real FM 97.1 The Authentic Station